A couple things. Let's turn over to the book of Acts. And as you're turning there, I anticipated tonight, uh, of course, these testimonies. And we're at a place in the book of Acts we've been looking through here. Uh, it's a somewhat of a transition, really. And I want to uh, use that as an opportunity tonight. And I know we've got school coming tomorrow. And we've got my surprise birthday party and so forth. So uh, I won't hopefully be too long tonight. But before I do this, I've been meaning to mention it. I don't always do this, but there is a, a burgundy old Schofield Bible that has been on the Welcome Center for quite some time, and it's obviously a Bible somebody's had for years. There's a lot of notes and writing and underlined verses and so forth. I can't believe somebody's not missing it. And you may not be here tonight, but I'm just throwing it out there that if you're missing a burgundy old Schofield, it's out there on the Welcome Center. We're not going to throw it away, but I've just been meaning to tell people I know somebody's got to be looking for it because it's... Um, it's one that you've obviously had for a long time. So just wanted to make that, uh, make you know, if you are missing a Bible or something, typically if you check the Welcome Center, that's usually where we put sort of like the lost and found. So uh, it doesn't stay there forever. We put it on Facebook Marketplace, get rid of some of them, but uh, you can check real quick. All right, if you find your place in Acts chapter 22, we've been looking through these chapters and of course by no means have been exhaustive. We've touched on some spots and kind of given the flow of this book. And you'll remember last week, Paul, of course, made this decision to go to Jerusalem. The chapter ends with the people in the temple in an uproar, uh, being led to think that Paul has brought a Gentile into another city and so forth. And it sort of ended that way. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And then we're going to look into chapter 22. Lord, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to be together, to fellowship, for these testimonies, for the opportunity we have tonight to just uh, gather around your word and to be challenged and helped. Lord, we do pray tonight that this service would draw us closer to you, that it would glorify you, and it would cause us to magnify Christ. We thank you for what you'll do now in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, Paul is pulled from the multitude by the centurion. There's such an uproar, he just figures this guy must be awful. He thinks, I don't know what he did, who he killed, what uh, group of people are trying to grab him. But just to kind of uh, keep the uproar down, they go in and they grab Paul and they put chains on him. Now, Paul, at, in the verse 39, says to the centurion who has grabbed him, he says, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Now, he got this man's attention because Paul uses the fact that he is a Roman citizen. Now, a couple of different times in his ministry, this ad advantaged him. And all through this, you're really going to see that Paul strategically uses uh, his providential position, different things that God's taught him, to give him an ability to share the gospel. You know, there's nothing wrong with being as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Paul mentions to this man where he's from because he'd like a minute to give his defense. Now think about this uproar. People are uh, uh, wanting to kill him. They're trying to take his life. The centurion rescues. There's still sort of a rumble. And then in chapter 22 in verse 1, Paul begins to speak. And he says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make unto you. And when they heard he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. Now, many of them spoke Greek. Many of them had different uh, languages because it was a very busy city and a place where a lot of people came through. But when he spoke specifically in Hebrew, it got their attention. Now, God undoubtedly quieted this crowd. Undoubtedly, it was not merely his language, but the fact that he was getting ready to give his testimony, God gave an opportunity and people now get quiet and they listen. So Paul begins to recount his testimony. You know, the first aspect of his testimony that he uses here is the fact that God gave him a vision. Look down in, a, in verse 5 as he begins to talk about how he's gone out persecuting Christians. And he says, also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, whom I also received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound into Jerusalem for to be punished. It came to pass as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around about me. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, 
whom thou persecutest. And he said, they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now, Paul well knew that there was a group of people. In fact, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they were the competing uh, band of Pharisees and Sadducees that ran things. But the Pharisees were very powerful. And remember, Paul himself was a Pharisee before he was saved. So he knew that they recognized the significance of a vision. Now, of course, we're not looking for a vision today. The Bible has been complete. We by no means expect God to speak us into a dream or some type of apparition. But a Pharisee very much expected that. Now, for 400 years, they had not really heard much. But they knew that God at sundry times spake to the prophets and in divers manners. So for Paul to stand and say, now my authority is that I saw the Lord Jesus, and here's what he said to me. Now, anybody can claim to have seen Jesus. But you'll remember now that many, many people around Jerusalem have claimed to have seen Jesus. Over 500 people claimed that they saw him after he rose from the dead. They knew that Paul went to persecute. How much sense did it make for Paul to go to Damascus to put Christians in jail, and then when he came, uh, never even made it to Damascus, but before he finishes that trip, he's a stalwart Christian preaching the resurrection of Christ. You remember in chapter 9, as soon as he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was blind. Of course, Ananias comes and, and opens up his eyes, and immediately it says he went into the synagogue preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, people remember this. They scratched their head. What in the world happened to Paul? I mean, how can Paul the persecutor be now Paul the preacher? And so his testimony was backed up by a change in his life. You know, there's no better way to back up your testimony for Christ and to tell people how you were saved than a change in your life. I mean, they saw a different man. They said, okay, that's what happened. Paul must have seen something. Something had to take place. And no doubt the men who were with him came back and said, we saw a great light. Now, they didn't hear the articulation of Jesus' words, but they heard something. They thought it thundered, and they said something remarkable took place. And here's Paul the persecutor, who now becomes Paul the preacher. So they're still listening. They're still interested. And Paul is appealing to those Pharisees, knowing that what he's saying fits in with their belief system. So he continues to give his testimony, and they begin to listen and begin to think, well, maybe that's what happened to Paul. You know, there'll be a time when he's going to give his testimony later, and the, the Pharisees say, well, if this man's seen a vision, and uh, who's to argue against it? Maybe it, there's something to it. They're listening until he gets here. In verse 17, it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him uh, saying unto me, Jesus, make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I've imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. When the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. It is not fit that he should live. You know, Paul was a man, obviously, filled with the Holy Spirit. A man, obviously, that God's hand was on. He had given his testimony, and a holy hush had fallen over the crowd. God allowed him to give this entire testimony, and no doubt people were being provoked. People's hearts were being turned. They were listening. And then basically what Paul said at the end is, Jesus told me, you, got, you folks aren't going to listen. And that bothered him. He said, he told me that even though you persecuted, even though you put, uh, stood by and consented to Stephen's death, don't you think that'll work? Jesus said, not these folks. They're not going to listen. And just like when Jesus was on the earth, he said there were many prophets in the day of Elisha the prophet, but God sent, uh, uh, God sent her, uh, the, Elijah to the woman in Zarephath, and it provoked them. I mean, there were many uh, lepers in Israel, but God healed Naaman the Syrian, and man, that provoked them. You mean God would help a Gentile over a Jew? The fact that they thought that he was interested in a Gentile and that we're rebels against God's word, man, that stirred their heart. Well, let me tell you, we don't preach today, per se, in the 
uh, same arena that Paul is preaching to Jews who, of course, uh, in, a, in a sense, are in blindness as far as the gospel. But you know, men's hearts are the same. You could tell men the truth. They know it when they hear it. They recognize it's significant. But when it's preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to yield or they're going to openly reject it. You know, it's remarkable they don't come down to the end of this and say, well, Paul, that's an interesting testimony. Never heard that perspective. Um, we really don't believe what you said. We don't think Jesus rose from the dead. But I can kind of see where if you had a vision, uh, maybe you're kind of thinking along that way. Oh, why don't you let the guy go? He's not that big a problem. No, they said he's not fit to live. If you give him to us, we'll take his head off. We'll kill him. Of course, the Roman government providentially preserves him from that. So Paul gives his testimony. And again, the Israel, as they often did, just like with Jesus, they rejected his testimony. Now, without going through a lot of uh, details, Paul again makes a point here. And in verse 25, it says, Now, as they had bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful to you to scourge a man that is Roman and uncondemned? You know, Paul uh, could have just been a martyr, I guess, and said, well, I guess if God wants me to get whipped, I'll get whipped and I'll take it. Frankly, if God's given you enough sense to, in honesty, uh, escape being a martyr or a beating, there's nothing wrong with following it. Paul said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm going to take advantage of it. I don't want to be beat. Now, some of this, evidently it didn't work every time because he had been beaten with rods. He had been scourged a number of times, um, perhaps even at the hand of Jews. But this halted it. This stopped it. But they keep him in prison. Then you go into chapter 23. Now, you notice in chapter 23 now, they bring him back before the Sanhedrin. Now, Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that, uh, that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then, Paul, uh, uh, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. You know he was a Baptist, had to be. He said, Thou sittest to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Do you know who sent Paul to Damascus? He had letters from the high priest. It's only tradition. It's not in the Bible. But there is certainly tradition that says that Paul could have been in line as a young man to be part of the Sanhedrin. I mean, he was the cream of the crop of the Pharisees, Gamaliel's best student, very respected among his peers. At a young age, he was already probably being considered for the Sanhedrin. So he knew most of these people. So the question is, how in the world did Paul, uh, he hears Ananias say this, but notice it uh, in verse 4, he's rebuked. And they said, it stood by, revilest thou God's high priest? They know he's one of the old Pharisees. They know he knows what it's all about. They can't believe he said that. Thou whited wall, God will smite you. I mean, it was what he said was true, but it was in a sense disrespectful. And so Paul says, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. How in the world could Paul not know who that was sitting up there on the Sanhedrin? He had gotten letters from him not too many years ago from the Damascus, the same guy that was the high priest in the Gospels. Well, the fact is, Paul didn't see too well. And he literally looked up and he knew who the Sanhedrin was up there. But somebody said, smite that guy in the mouth. And he didn't even know it was the, uh, the Sanhedrin because he couldn't see. But you know, he sure had some humility about him, didn't he? When he was told the truth and he recognized, you know what? Uh, I can go as far as I can go on the right road. What I said, if that was the high priest, I did it in error. Now, if it had been the guy sitting next to me, he is a whited wall and God is going to smite him. But since it's the high priest, I at least can let God take care of him. Well, he had some humility. Well, he goes on to give his uh, appeal here now understanding in verse 6 that some of these are Sadducees, some are Pharisees. So when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. When he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. 
For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees can confess both. Do you know Paul knew that? I mean, Paul looks out at the group. He said, I got this Sanhedrin here. I remember the old days back when I had graduated from Gamaliel University. And, you know, these guys were constantly arguing over, you know, the Sadducees didn't believe there was such thing as an angel. They didn't believe there was any spirit. Uh, everything was pretty much just right now. They were just basically standard liberals uh, like you would have today. But they were very religious. The Pharisees believed the law of Moses also the, the fathers and so forth and the writings. Uh, but they definitely believed in a resurrection. They, um, Jesus said about the Pharisees in chapter 23 of Matthew, he said, they sit in Moses' seat. So whatever they bid you observe, the problem with a Pharisee is they said it, they didn't do it. They, they had the truth as far as speaking it. Paul knew that there was an argument that was an ongoing argument about the resurrection. So it was almost like Paul just sort of chuckled under his breath. He said, I know how to settle this hash. He said, I stand today in uh, uh, standing for the resurrection that I believe God promised to the fathers. And man, that just started the argument going. The Pharisee says, well, this guy's not as dumb as he looks. And the Sadducees, well, no, we don't believe that. He's obviously an idiot. And he got him arguing. Now, I say again, you can be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Paul is harmless on the one sense that he says, I wish not, brethren, that it was the high priest. Sorry about that. I erred. He's humble. But at the same time, he says, you know, I think I can get myself out of a little trouble here if I get them arguing over the resurrection. And, of course, it worked. Now, Paul doesn't get free here, but I do like what it says in verse 11. The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem... So, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, I don't know if you remember last week, we discussed at length a little bit about uh, Paul's decision to go to Rome. Was that God's will for him to go? He'd been warned several times not to. But whatever he went, he went in the integrity of his heart. And even though he's there, and God obviously had called him to be a minister to the Gentiles, God says, Paul, and he doesn't say even though you shouldn't have come. We couldn't read that into it, but he says, Paul, don't worry about it. It doesn't seem to be going well, but you're going to go to Rome and you're going to preach the gospel. Do you know in spite of what Paul faces now, I mean, he's going to go to shipwreck. He's going to be passed from one ruler to the next. Uh, he'll almost get free. Uh, he almost has an opportunity to be turned loose, but he has to appeal to Caesar. In the last part of this chapter, I'm not going to take time to read the verse, there's literally a conspiracy. Forty men get together and say, we will not eat until we kill the Apostle Paul. In the next chapter, they starve to death. But anyway, uh, they, they didn't end up getting him because God told Paul, you're going to make it to Rome. Do you know no matter what Paul went through, he could look back to this promise and say, look, it's looking pretty bleak out here. I mean, we're in the middle of the ocean and this ship's about to go down. But you'll remember he calls those men together and encourages them and says, look, God's already told me we're going to make it. God told him he was going to Rome. And you know, God's told us we're going to make it. If we know the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, uh, they may cut our head off, but God will give us another one and put a crown on top of that. I mean, we've got some precious promises from God that no matter how much the, the nation that we live in crumbles, no matter how much the world becomes anti-God or opposed to the Bible, they're just fulfilling what God says is going to take place. We are on the winning side. And Paul was on the winning side, and God encouraged his heart. Now, this chapter, again, where Paul introduces his testimony, uh, it lands him, of course, now in a, in a Roman prison. It's going to give occasion, and we're going to deal with this as God gives us opportunity it's going to give him occasion now to stand before kings, as God told him he was going to do, and give testimony to the grace of God at the high levels of the Roman government. We're going to stop there tonight, and we're going to have a word of prayer.